Kia ora e te koutou. Marky here in voice but uh, not in body uh, because the beautiful image that you have before you is not me but our, one of our leading therapists, Gwendolyn. Uh, those of you that support the channel have uh, seen a little bit of Gwendolyn before. She's featured in videos and we wanted to feature in many, many more videos. And uh, we recently had a, a query come in from somebody that uh, we thought we'd address in a video. And rather than listen to my voice again, I thought we'd pitch this to Gwendolyn instead. So this is going to take the form of a bit of a, an interview, a Q&A. Uh, so what shall we say about you? How should we introduce you to the, to the good wow. people on Patreon and YouTube? I think you've already, you've done very well just now and also... Well, I said you were beautiful, didn't I? Well, that was kind of funny. I, I was, quite like that. I was more thinking about uh, <laughs> when you've introduced me before, so there is another video where, where you introduced me. Yeah, what, what Gwendolyn is referring to is our first take where it all went wrong. <laughs> oh, yes, that. It did go a bit wrong, but yeah, it's good, part so, of the fun. So Gwendolyn works with me on TTAC, the uh, Taranaki Transgender Assessment and Counselling Service, and uh, on Retract.com, Retractive Jealousy. Uh, and works independently as a psychodynamic psychotherapist or counsellor because uh, she works internationally and um, so uses different titles sometimes and uh, we're going to be mainly we're going to be veering the subject towards more towards retroactive jealousy today but the subject is a very broad one which should be of general interest to everyone are you ready to rock and roll i am thank is you is there anything you want to add to your introduction uh no i think you've covered it thank okay. you gwendolyn is um is wearing sunglasses yes, uh, not, sorry to, about not that. to try and be kind of <laughs> cool and street but because um we've got some weird weather phenomena going on we've got um it's quite chilly, so she's um, she's wrapped up as well, and the sun's shining right in her eyes. But we wanted to treat you to a bit of a sea view, such as such as it is. Although there's lampposts everywhere, which kind of spoil it a little bit. Um, and we've got some weird weather going on. We had some sun dogs uh, just behind us, uh, which is a kind of a, a visual phenomenon that occurs around the sun, which is supposed to be very auspicious. So I think it's a good day to to shoot this video. So the query that we had. Um, as if, you know, I think it's something that, that's come up for me a, a few times in, in clinical work and I think is really overlooked and seldom talked about because um, we're both familiar with, uh, with the field of sexual abuse survivors, you know, people who've, who've experienced sexual abuse of various forms in childhood and the kind of horrible after effects that that has right throughout life. I think we've, we've both experienced in that field. But one thing that people seldom discuss or even mention is how that might affect a partner so a partner somebody that gets together in a relationship with someone who has experienced childhood sexual abuse and the kind of implications that that might have in some circumstances so what what, what are your thoughts on that well um yeah this is obviously a complex subject and we're, we're going to try and keep this this video not too long <laughs> and to, to keep it keep it kind of succinct but I'll, I'll try and um, maybe cover some of the, the things that uh, come up in my clinical practice and that, that I've experienced and heard from my patients. So um, I think there are a couple of factors that, that might make this slightly more challenging or less challenging. For example, if what we hear a lot of with um, our RJ clients and patients is that um, the, dis the timing of the disclosure around relationships seems to have an impact about the on the effect in terms of the effect it has so that's one one aspect um, which is maybe not the most important but I think um, yeah so for example I'm just I'm just imagining if two people got together as friends first got to know each other and, and heard about some of the trauma from from the partner's background and then ultimately got into a relationship that might be a bit different to you know the more kind of classic dating uh, and then boyfriend girlfriend type are oh, how many partners have you had and that conversation which is really obviously very triggering for people with RJ and then it coming out in just, that respect just to cut in if I may so yes. RJ stands for yeah retroactive jealousy I'm sorry I thought you were gonna fill the gap so yeah. our, our, most of our views are probably yeah yours. I'm assuming so you guys to the, to the know, jealousy, know what that because that puts a, a sting in the tail with this mm. first read. But what I want to look first, really, for more sort of general interest of people, is mm. the issues for for just anyone, not not necessarily with right, so, so yeah. uh, Let's say um, you know a uh, somebody in a relationship discloses uh, parental incest, um, a, 
parents are still alive, maybe, um, and maybe you know what? What are kind of you know some of the many sort of implications mm. of that? Well, it's fraught, isn't it? I think um, yeah. Let's stick with with a particular example as you've given parental incest. So for the partner, um, one of the things that feels perhaps difficult is you know how that person then will relate to um, the partner's parent going forward, and how you know with that information, knowing that, how do you continue to have a relationship with yeah. the wider family? That's a huge challenge yeah. and something that the couple will have to decide for themselves how they how they handle. Um, obviously, there can be lots of feelings of anger and rage and uh, kind of a desire for revenge um, that, that comes through as well. Um, and you know if it touches any other wounds in the in the partner then it it will be you know just magnify all of that everything i've said so kind of mirroring with, yes with, it, with unresolved issues in exactly the, yeah. yeah so so those are some of the things that um are really quite common in in what from what i've heard and really painful um and i think probably what's really important for the couple is to to have as you know within reason and, and to, to the degree that feels okay for both parties but to have these conversations before especially before big big celebrations like Christmas and any time where there's gonna be family gatherings right, yeah. what you don't want is to turn up at a family thing where you haven't thought these things through and around the boundaries about how you continue to interrelate with the extended family if we're sticking to this example so so yes to be really clear with each other about what's okay what's not okay um, you know and, and some sometimes I find with these kinds of dynamics with families where incest takes place there's usually uh, an issue with boundaries there's usually an issue with um, another form of abuse so it will be especially important if the parent for example is still alive for that couple to yeah as I say be really careful about how they how they cope going forward so that for example you don't go to Christmas dinner and it ends up being an eight-hour thing and then the person who's recovering from the abuse whether the parents and the family know or not they are going to be impacted by that and then their partner will also be impacted so, so, so they need to figure this stuff out before they go back into the situation where they're going to be interacting with the previous abuser so what you're saying is that in in families where there's been abuse there are generally generally you know right across the board kind of boundary issues that affect other areas yes and that that um that and what's the risk of that? Is getting getting kind of drawn into something? Or what, Absolutely, what? yeah. Getting drawn back into old patterns. I mean, we all do this anyway. Even if we've come from good enough kind of family backgrounds, we all, to some extent, in my view anyway, it's another son dog, another little auspicious oh, sign. Right. Sure. Um, but I think we all, to some degree or another, regress when we're with our families of origin. That's kind of normal. Yeah. However when you have a family where there has been abuse that's taken place that's been a parent to a child for example if we're staying with this example it, it tells us a lot you know that doesn't happen un unless there are other breakdowns in the family unfortunately and um it, it, so it, you know it's, it's almost unheard of i would argue that you know you have sexual abuse or incest without some other form of abuse being there it doesn't come alone it doesn't come alone and, it, and if you think about it it kind of makes sense because you know sexual abuse is not only about the the sexual violation but it's the physical abuse as well yeah um yeah. and usually in order for it to take place in the first place there's going to be some emotional abuse some manipulation as well so this is what this is why i say that you know where there's one, there'll be another form, sadly. So the partner could be walking into quite a messy kind of family soup. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's really difficult because, you know, you, the, the couple might know, they might be able to exchange glances with each other, knowing looks and stuff, but the energy around them will potentially be quite crazy making and, yeah. and really disrupt their own relationship. So, so that has to be handled, I think, with, with great care. It's a lot to take on board, isn't it? It is, yeah. it is, yeah. So what about, you know, in terms of when a disclosure is made by a partner about, you know, some, some sexual abuse, which might be a detailed disclosure, might be a very vague disclosure, I guess, you know, depending on how safe that person feels or mm. what, they, what they want to share. What does that information do you know what can that information do inside a partner's head what can what what effects can that have when when somebody hears that what what kind of mm. what does that do when a partner hears about sexual abuse 
in somebody that they love and that yeah. they're in a relationship with? I think the the kind of analogy I would say I would give is it's like a cluster bomb. So you know, cluster bombs. The idea. This is my idea. Not that I'm technical on army <laughs> and, and armed uh, forces or anything like that. But the idea that you know you you've got one bit of information that kind of triggers a whole chain reaction of other pieces to that um, that are equally devastating. And you know, with one with one disclosure. Um, there are a thousand questions. So in other words, yeah. it, it has a kind of ripple effect or a ricochet effect, if you yeah, like. Never ending. Maybe. Never ending, it, c it can be. Um, and in a way, it, it is, you know, this stuff isn't easy. Um, it's not to say that it will always feel very heavy in the way that it does at first disclosure. And I, I really don't think that's true, particularly if both parties or one of the parties, particularly the victim, as it were, um, is in therapy. So there's going to be a process that, that happens and a grieving and a, and a moving of through of something. But in the first instance, yes, it, I think it, it is a bit like a cluster bomb. So for the partner, there are going to be a kind of cascade of emotions and feelings and really kind of some of them really being conflicted so that, you know, I can I can think about, you know, what patients have told me in the past when this scenario has uh, unfolded and there can be guilt you know um even irrational guilt even even guilt like god why wasn't i there at the time right. why couldn't yeah, i protect, protect them yeah, exactly yeah. yeah exactly even though yeah. it's impossible but our, our minds and our psyches don't always work with rationality you know so so that can be there it can be you know anger there can be you know, people can wake in the middle of the night feeling like I'm going to go and kill the person. I'm going to go and kill them. And they can, you can be, you know, consumed by a feeling of wanting to take revenge. Um, that can be really difficult, you know. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and particularly because the partner is in a different place. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Now, and speaking of different places, we're going to have to pause now, annoyingly, because um, <laughs> because we I can only upload quite short videos. So uh, we're going to, uh, ladies and gentlemen, back at home, we're going to pause for a second. Uh, and then catch we'll up with us straight away in part two. <laughs>